Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to get primitive with the absolutely brutal 2015 horror western Bone Tomahawk. Let's get to it. We open on a brutal murder taking place as a portion of a larger bushwhacking still in progress. As the assailants sift through the belongings looking for any loose change, they're interrupted by the sound of horses in the distance. They scurry off to hide, pushing past a variety of clear signs warning them away, and eventually find themselves standing their ground against an unknown threat, and are savaged by a dark figure. Eleven days later, we find ourselves in the small town of Bright Hope. Arthur O'Dwyer is sulking on the couch, despondent about a leg injury that caused him to miss out on a work opportunity, but affords him some quality time with his wife Samantha. We later find Sheriff Hunt, visited by a breathless Deputy Chicory, who had been out on a night ramble when he spied a transient burying luggage in a suspicious manner. They depart to make a survey and take a few moments to question the drifter, casting numerous aspersions. Purvis attempts to play it cool until he doesn't, but only makes it about a foot, and then they drag him off to the station. Mr. Bruder fetches Samantha due to her leg wound experience and because the dock would be too deep in his cup at this hour. They receive her at the jail, providing any provisions she requests. Hunt intends to leave Deputy Nick with her for the evening. The sheriff apprises Arthur of the situation and they all settle in for a quiet, restful night. Uh, except for Buford, he hears someone riling the horses and goes to check the stable, and he won't see another sunrise. In the morning, Clarence alerts the sheriff that he came upon Buford's mutilated remains, and in attempting to enlist the service of a deputy, found the jail empty. The jail is indeed found to be empty, save a bit of peculiar evidence. They meet at the Learned Goat, where Chicory brings the professor to weigh his opinion. He identifies the arrow as belonging to a primitive, pre-lingual tribe they call the Troglodytes, and all other tribes generally steer clear of them if they're able. He points to Posse in their general direction, and backs away slowly. Hunt tells Arthur about what happened and he can't deter him from embarking with the group. So the volunteers all collect their provisions and make their final arrangements, before mounting up and proceeding to travel in a cinematographically pleasing manner. They set up camp for the evening and we get a better sense of their characters when Bruder gets a little too commanding and Chicory sets him right, demonstrating his fierce loyalty to both the sheriff and the hierarchical command structure. Then they get on to some more riding, watering, and specking. At the next break point, Arthur takes a moment to check his leg, which is rotting slowly. Hunt takes the opportunity to confiscate his opium for his own benefit, to keep him in the saddle, and only allows him to proceed if he agrees to be checked by Chicory later on, which results in some gangrenous concerns. They're then approached by strangers in the night. Hunt handles the situation with caution while Bruder opts for precaution, surmising that they must be scouts for a raiding party. They're uneasy about the ethics of this, but it bears out later when they awake at their new camp to a bushwhacking in progress. They manage to survive, but find themselves sans horses from that point on. O'Dwyer suggests walking at night and sleeping at dawn, and he commits to continuing until he catches them while they sleep. He heads out as they break camp, getting a good lead, but likely wishing he had two crutches. They eventually overtake him, agreeing to mark the trail ahead with stones. He's overcome with a crippling loneliness, so after catching them and getting not quite enough sleep, he's determined to keep up this time. However, a simple innuendo about his wife brings him down, and the prognosis is not good. They agree to setting it rather than amputating. He takes a sip of the good stuff, says his I'm sorry's, and prepares his body for an extreme violation. The next morning, the gang finds themselves getting closer, eventually picking up the trail of the stolen stable horses from town which leads them to the appropriate valley and some familiar omens of bad fortune. They continue their approach, constantly aware of a loud, distant, droning sound they interpret as an alarm to their presence. They arrive at a high cave and are descended upon in silent and brutal fashion. Recognizing the end is near, Bruder asks to be left behind with a repeater, a cigar, and a stick of dynamite. Unfortunately, he only manages to make an even trade and the others don't get far either. They're hoisted into the cave where they find Mrs. O'Dwyer and Deputy Nick, Purvis having been previously consumed. Samantha confirms for them that obedience is the best policy. They pull Nick out of his cage for dinner time, and we get a demonstration of their casual brutality when one of them unhesitatingly lops off Hunt's fingers for being too noisy, and then again when they proceed to butcher Nick in a scene that I can't even get close to showing. Meanwhile, we see that Arthur has woken up and proceeds in a westerly direction, traveling day and night, occasionally succumbing to doses of opium, but a familiar distant moaning sound snaps him back to consciousness. Back in the cave, Samantha confirms she had counted approximately 12 males, and they enact a plan wherein they fight over a flask in order to trick them into drinking its contents, which are poisoned with tinctures. In the midst of another opium nap, Arthur is surprised by two troglodytes who manage to screw their short-range ambush, but just barely. He discovers the strange noises they've been making are coming from a voice box modification, which he extracts and puts his mouth on in a very disgusting manner, using it to flush out another one and finding his stature to be an advantage. In the cave, the poisoning works and Hunt is administered a fitting punishment when they insert the now-hot flask into his torso. They're eventually interrupted by gunshots both far and near, giving Hunt an opportunity to exact some revenge punishment before he dies. He instructs Chicory to escort the O'Dwyer's home while he stays behind to try to execute the remaining males. And on their way across the valley, they hear several gunshots in the distance and hope for the best. And that was Bone Tomahawk, a movie that, despite its long runtime and relatively slow pace, feels unrelenting. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.